All right, guys, with the new NAR settlement in place, there are a lot of different things that are going to happen in the world of real estate. Stick with us, and we'll talk specifically about buyers and buyer agent agreements. You better get fired up. My button didn't work, man. How you doing with that? <laughs> Take a second. I'm good. How are you, Joe? I'm doing awesome, man. I'm doing awesome. I love Mondays. I'm that weird creature mm -hmm. who loves Mondays. So I'm doing pretty good. Uh, that's awesome. It sets the tune for the week. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. And I love being around people who love Mondays, man. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about what the settlement is first and kind of what the implications uh, have been. And, and everything I'm about to say, it, nothing has been put in place in writing yet. There is no final settlement in writing. So this is all what I've heard, what I'm guessing, the different possibilities. But I think it's really important to hear, especially if you are going to buy a home in the next, say, three, six, nine, 12 months. It's going to be really important to, to at least consider these things, right? So the the two rules that have been heavily discussed with the NAR settlement, uh, NAR is National Association of Realtors, right? Is that come, I've heard July 1st and I've heard August, but I'm, I'm leaning towards probably August, they are going to not allow sellers to, you're not even allowed to, you can't do it if you want to do it, to market a commission on the MLS. Right now you market a commission. So when you're paying, say, a 6% commission, uh, typically the listing agent's going to keep roughly half and they're going to pay out roughly half. But let's just say, for example, sake it is half and half. They're going to pay out the other 3%, right? They're going to keep three, pay out three. And so now as a buyer's agent, I'm able to see, okay, this house is paying me three. This one's paying me three and a half. This one's paying me two. You can see all that, right? <clears throat> With the settlement, they're getting rid of that. You're no longer uh, going to be able to see it. Now, I've heard rumors that you are going to be able to, in the broker's remarks, put in there that the seller is willing to pay up to X percent, whatever they choose to put in there, towards buyer's closing costs, prepaids, whatever, right? Now, that could be used to cover the commission that the buyer owes the agent, the buyer's agent. So rule number two is, as a buyer, you're not going to be able to look at any homes, the interior of any homes, without having a buyer rep agreement with that agent, right? There's a lot of different implications with that. So number one, I think it's important to note that if agents are doing it correctly, the buyer rep agreement essentially says, hey, I as an agent am giving you all of these fiduciary duties. I am I'm taking care of you financially and I'm hooking you up with a lender and I'm going to show you homes and I'm going to you know work in a timely fashion. I'm going to communicate and all these different things you got to do uh, fiduciary wise, right? Uh, but then from the buyer, it's saying, and it's in Florida anyway, it's section 7A of our buyer rep agreement. It says that I as a buyer will pay you as an agent X percent, whatever that percentage is, uh, minus whatever a seller or a listing agent is compensating you. Uh, so if you're going to pay me three and they're paying me three, well, then you owe me nothing. Uh, if you're going to pay me three and they're paying two and a half, then you would owe me 0.5. Now, some agents waive that, right? And they say, don't worry about it. I'll cover the 0.5 just by the Dagon house. You know, we want to make sure you're happy. What's happening in, I'm going to say August, but we're still not 100% sure, is now a buyer has to be in a buyer's rep. And we don't know how many sellers are going to move forward with, hey, I'm not going to pay a commission to a buyer's rep. That's going to create a huge issue. I think a lot of sellers have it in their minds that, cool, now I don't have to pay a commission to the buyer's rep. I'm set. I, I don't see that happening, at least not to the extent that a lot of people think, because it's going to take a huge portion. And, and I'm just guessing maybe 30, 40, 50% of the buyers out of the buyer pool. And it's going to significantly impact your price much more than the commission you would otherwise be paying. And if you do find the buyers who are willing to represent themselves and not take on a realtor and save you that commission, I can tell you, and, and Lizette, I'm going to guess that you're going to agree with me here. If I have 10 deals, I'm the list agent, I have 10 deals with 10 brand new buyer's agents. And I got another 10 deals on the list agent with 10 very experienced, let's say 10 plus years, buyer's agents. I'm probably going to close 8, 9, 10 of these 10 over here with the experienced agents. 
Over here with the rookie agents, I might close three, four, five. Whatever the number is, it's going to be significantly different because of the lack of experience, because of the lack of having failed a million times and found out what actually wins, what gets the job done. If that's what a licensed agent does, imagine what a buyer who has no clue what they're doing is going to do or not do and how often those deals are going to fall apart, right? So I see this being a pretty pretty big challenge. So right now looking at, okay, you're you're a brand new buyer. You're hopping into the market and you're saying, I want to go look at these posts the buyer does. And now when you call me, now if you know me, it's different. But what if you don't know me? What if I'm the listing agent or you found me through Zillow or or I was, ref well, referral's a little bit different. You'd be comfortable with that. But we don't have a relationship. And you want to look at 123 3rd Street, which is my listing. And I say, I can only show you this property if you sign this agreement with me that states, pay me 3% commission minus whatever the other side is paying me out. That's going to be a little scary. So with all that said, Lizette, what do you see playing out? Uh, and there's a lot of different avenues we could go down with this. But what do you see playing out as far as buyers, their comfort level, these contracts, uh, maybe different business models and real estate? How, how do you see that playing out? There's so much in, up in the air right now that we don't know, and things are still changing. There's so many new factors that are coming into play also. So it's still not clear what's going to be required. But the one thing I think that's very consistent is that we're going to have to have this buyer broker agreement signed before we even show a property. We're going to have to disclose what our fees are, and you as a buyer ha are with the agreement, if you agree, to pay for those fees or for us to try to negotiate that into the sale of the property. So that factor of it, I'm actually looking forward to i think it's going to up a lot of people's games i think it's a type of form of business that we should have been doing all along is taking our buyers through the process a little bit more detailed and have yeah. a moment to actually sit down before i mean you've probably gotten a ton of calls and me too hey can i go see a house right now we're down the road it's like yeah. no there's a process to this we're gonna have to slow it down now depending the market it could be you know helpful <laughs> or not because like when we were in COVID, we had to run out and go see properties before they're under contract. Yeah. But it's just going to make us to build that relationship with our buyer up front. Yeah. And they get the choice. Do you want to work with us or not? And if you do, okay, well, these are the terms and everything within the contract is negotiable as well, including how long are we putting this contract together that you and me are going to be working together? What type of property are we looking for? Um, so I think it just makes everything a lot more clear when it comes to the buyer broker agreement, but there's still a lot that needs to be, you know, played out and a lot that needs to be decided on. So even August, I'm still I'm like iffy if that's even going to be able to be pulled together. Yeah, we'll see if I remember correctly. I think there was like a, a, a deadline of December is when everything had to be implemented gotcha. and good. Um, is that negotiable? Can they move that? I don't know. Um, and so we'll see what happens, but I agree with you. And I've, I've said this for years. It's so interesting to me. And I, I think I know why, and I'm generalizing, but I think this is probably 80, 90% of the reason why. When you look at sellers, uh, even if you love Joe Rosen, you love Lizette Hurtado, you're probably still going to consider and interview one or two other agents. It's just normal, right? You're going to be spending five, six, 7% in a commission. Why wouldn't you interview a few agents? Not just to see hey, can I save on commission? But what am I getting for that commission? Is it worth saving? Maybe it's worth spending a little bit more because I get a bunch more marketing or I get more experience or I get more exposure, whatever it is. But you've always, as a listing agent, had to sell yourself. You've had to show the value and you've had to justify your commission, which is awesome. You should have to do that. Anytime I buy something, hey, I don't mind paying money for it. I, it's a business. It is what it is. But I want to know that I'm getting the most bang for my buck. What are you doing and how much is it going to cost me? And I think buy or sellers have done a phenomenal job of that over the years. However, when it comes to buyers, I, I'm, I'm throwing this out there, but I want to say with 70% of buyers, 78% of buyers work with the first agent that they meet. So as long as you pick up your phone and you talk to them and you know whatever, 78% of people are going to continue working with you. And I think it's 78% because, which is a large number, because they don't see the overwhelming value in you, right? As a buyer's agent, they look at you like you open doors, 
-hmm. You write a contract that takes you 30 minutes and then you go to closing and you get this big commission check and that's it. And I do think we as an industry could get a lot better. And, and now we're going to be forced to get a lot better, which is great for buyers at explaining everything that we do, right? Even me, I have said this in the past, you know, I kind of hide a lot of that stuff that I do behind the scenes for my buyers because I don't want to stress them out. I don't want them thinking about all these things. I don't want them seeing all these things. But now I think it's really important to have that, you know, 133 thing checklist that we do for every uh, <laughs> transaction and literally show them every single thing we're doing, every text we get, every call we get, every time we got talk to title, every time we got a title, because it's a lot, man. It is hours and hours and hours and hours and hours that you put into every single transaction. And I just don't think they see it. And I, you know, I can only look at my business model, but that was no accident. I didn't want them to see it because I didn't want to inundate them with more stressful things. Right. But now I think it's upon us to absolutely show our value. What I'm hoping this does, <clears throat> and, and I wished it had already happened, is it encourages buyers at the onset of wanting to go out, right? And even if you don't know about the settlement and, and you forget everything we're talking about right now, that agent, if things go the way I assume it's going to go, is going to say on the first phone call, I can't show you a home unless you get into a buyer's rep agreement with me. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that pushes you as a buyer to say, hmm, sellers interview three agents. Why wouldn't I interview three agents, right? Go do that Google search. Go check out some people on Facebook. Ask for recommendations from people that you know who own homes and have, have bought and sold in the area. That's probably the best way. And then interview them. How much are you locking me in for on commission, right? How is this going to work if the seller isn't paying a commission? Uh, what did I get from you? Are you a part-time agent or a full-time agent? How many hours do you work? Because there's a difference between a 40-hour full-time agent and an 80-hour-a-week full-time agent, right? Um, what hours can I call you? What days can I call you? Um, do you have assistance? Do you have a team? Do you have a process? What kind of CRM do you have? Um all these different things that you're going to uh, want out of your buyer's agent. And it's tough, right? I'm sure a lot of agents are going to come up with videos now talking about their value, right? Watch a mm -hmm. few of them as a buyer and you'll see, oh, I can ask for this. This is expected. They'll do this. It's really important to note that, right? And I, I think really your availability, your expertise, how many sales you've had. And as a buyer, I want to know, on average, what is the sales price compared to asking price? Because if Lizette is getting homes for 98% for a buyer uh, of original asking price, and I'm getting them for 99.5, well, obviously, Lizette is 1.5% better of a negotiator than I am. On average, that's a sales point, right? How many buyers are going to ask those questions? Right now, I'm, I'm telling you from experience, it's 1%. Like, nobody asks mm -hmm. those questions. If they like you and you'll you'll pick up your phone and you'll open the door, <laughs> they're good. They're happy, right? It's about to change with that commission being put on your back. So now let me ask you this, Lizette. How do you see it working out? Because now it's going to be promoted. A lot of sellers are going to see this and they're going to say, I read the, the I've already heard this. Mm -hmm. I have read the NAR settlement or I've heard about the NAR settlement. Sellers don't need to pay commissions anymore. Awesome. Let's list my house at 3% paying out nothing. How are you going to discuss that situation with a buyer when they're concerned about, I don't want to have to pay an extra 3%. Do I have to pay you, Lizette, 3%? How's that discussion going to work out? I think it's it's a discussion that needs to be had up front. Well, and the agent needs to explain to the buyer, we are going to proceed as if you are paying this fee. Because I rather you have the expectation that you do have to come up with this fee and then great, we negotiated, we got the deal, the fees are covered, you don't have to pay it. Then to then set the expectation that we'll find a seller, we'll find the property, we'll put in the deal, you don't worry about it. And then now we come time to go under contract and you fell in love with this property, but the seller says, absolutely not, I'm yeah. not paying for it. So now you're in a bind because you did sign a contract with me already. I showed you this <sighs> property, you love the property. And now that fee is in the way. So I'd rather set that expectation up front 
and know this is the way it could proceed. Now, I see a lot of agents handling a little bit different because also we have to see this as the bigger picture. We have first time home buyers, we have VA buyers. Yeah. Maybe we have buyers that really are just get to know you, talk to you, and they already have a house in mind and we go on a contract. Is that fee going to be different from client to client? I think that's something as an industry, we're probably going to have to work through and figure that out as well. Yeah, it's really interesting. And then, you know, I know we've talked about this before. I see FHA came up with a statement the other day, but I have not mm -hmm. seen it from VA where FHA, if I understood it correctly, will allow the... So right now, the, the way that I understand it, ah, that's not necessarily true. The way it will be with FHA, if I understood it correctly, is the buyer can use some of the seller paid buyer's closing costs to cover the commission. That is not how it's currently written with the VA. So the challenge for a VA buyer, again, if I understand where we're at correctly, is, okay, I love Lizette. She's a great buyer's agent. I want to work with Lizette. She's telling me I got to pay 3%. Great. But the VA won't allow me to pay a realtor's fee. And the realtor also, or the uh, VA also won't allow the seller to pay my closing costs. They will allow that, but not to go towards a commission or a, uh, a brokerage fee. So now no agent is going to take someone on like that. So now a VA buyer has to go in unrepresented. Well, like I said earlier, man, I'm not saying I'd want to or anything like that, but you got to remember as a listing agent, you represent the seller. Your job is, and, and a lot of people think it's all price, right? I can come in and I can negotiate. Great. Maybe I'm price, maybe, but all the little intricacies of that 12 page contract, plus all the addenda that get connected to it. And some of those contracts can be 20, 30 pages in total. There are 87 different ways to position a seller considerably better than a buyer. If thing one pops up, thing 13 pops, pops up, thing 87 pops up. And I, I do believe if we see, and I think we will at least short term, buyers go down the road of representing themselves. The next set of headlines over the next six to 12 months, once this is implemented, is going to be lawsuits on the behalf of buyers coming after, you know, either list agents or sellers or whoever. And, and I don't think they're going to win a lot of these. And it's going to become a scary situation. I think it's going to turn into like going to court without an attorney, right? What are your thoughts on that? And the belief that a buyer, and, and I'm not talking about somebody who's purchased six homes or they're an investor. I'm talking about just Joe Blow, who's maybe purchased one or two homes in their life or zero. A lot of people are first time home buyers. Uh, and even when they buy, the last time they purchased was six years ago. Real estate's changed so much in that six years. Um, and you only see this much of what's going on as a buyer. I don't care how many times you've purchased. You only see a certain amount of the transaction because we, we hide a lot of it from you. Again, not to be not transparent, but because we don't want to talk to you about every single text and every email and, mm -hmm. hey, this happened. But if this happens and this is going to happen, you got to have this. We're not going to tell you all that. It's just when a problem occurs and you need to be a part of it. We rope you in and we tell you what's going on. Lizette, where do you, what do you see when it comes to lawsuits with buyers? And what is your opinion of the, the genuine ability of, let's say, zero to two purchases ever, that type of buyer representing themselves? I think up front and at first for the next 12 months, maybe 18 months, we're going to see a little bit of chaos. Because we're going to see a lot of buyers come out and say, you know what? I don't want representation. I'm not going to pay that fee. I'm going to go and do it on my own. And then that's where the issues are going to arise. A seller is going to say, well, I'm not paying that fee. So the buyer is going to go and try to do it themselves. They're not educated. They don't know how the process is. And they're going to feel taken advantage of from the seller or the listing agent. And that's where I think we're going to have a lot of conflict. And I think it's going to be a learning process. And that's where I think we're going to come back to where we started, why do we need buyers, yeah. agents? Why do we need representation? Why do we need someone to guide us through the transaction? But unfortunately, I think we're going to have to go and weed it out through the chaos for a little bit. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just give you a great example, man. Myself, I am on an HOA board 
and they're all volunteers and we don't get paid and we're not professional board members, right? We do our best. We come with great intent, but we don't know what we're doing. We're, we're just doing our best. And I can't tell you how many times I was 95% sure this is how we do this thing. And then I get on the phone with the attorney and, and that's his realm. That's his complex realm that I might think I understand. And I even have all the documents. I got all the Florida statutes at the, you know, my fingertips. I've got our HOA documents at my fingertips. And within 30 seconds, he'll say, Joe, turn to page 32 in your documents and blah, 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 blah. And paragraph three states, you can't do it because of this and this and this. And I'm just wowed at how quick he is and how, even though I think I'm a pretty smart guy, I am not intelligent in the world of legalities when it comes to uh, an HOA. I'm getting there. I'm certainly getting better. <laughs> but uh, that's a great example of you can be the sharpest guy in the world and you can think you know because you purchased a home one time. But man, when you look at the intricacies, of all those documents, it is so much. This sounds like a pitch. I'm, I'm really... You know, I'm a realtor, so obviously it's going to sound like a realtor trying to pitch that you use realtors. I, I fully get that. But I genuinely do think you should be using a realtor. Again, if you've purchased seven homes as investments, you know the documents inside out, maybe you can get away with it and that's fine. Um, there's not just the expertise portion of it though. There's the time portion. It's a lot of follow-up phone calls, emails, texts, and they got to be made timely. If you make them when you get home from work at 6 p.m. every day, when everybody else is closed down, that, that, mm. that's probably not going to work that well, right? Um, I, I do think though, as a realtor, there are people who can get away with not using a realtor. That's just fine. I think those people are already doing it though. I mean, investors will come to you, but I'll tell you even educated investors. One of my good friends, uh, Josh Bradley is not only an investor, but a real estate broker. And he will constantly come to all of us as realtors and say, Hey, if you get me a deal, I'm going to list it with you. And here's what I'm going to do. He is talking about, this is his whole pitch, getting you as a realtor involved and making sure you get paid because he sees the value in using you again in the future. And he sees the value in not having to put all the time into that deal, right? He mm -hmm. wants to go work on other things. And so hopefully I'm not putting words in his mouth, but uh, <laughs> he, he says that all the time. He's one of the greatest investors to work with. And that's why we love working with him. But because we see that, what do we as realtors do for him? We're giving him all the deals in the world. So he's got a whole bunch of realtors throwing stuff at him because we're the most excited to work with him. So even real estate investors use realtors. I see the people who aren't going to use realtors are the people who, and listen, I'm going to give you a hard time right now, but I've been this person before. The people who think, oh, I can do this. I can do this. Mm -hmm. This is so easy. And they haven't. And they get absolutely smoked to the tune of 20, 30, 40, 50,000 or some monstrous issue that they now have to live with. And because they now know about it, they'd either have to live with it or disclose it if they sell. And that would cost them a lot because they're going to lose money because now I mean, think if my home is worth 500 grand, but then I tell you all the walls are filled with mold, are you going to pay 500 grand? No, you're probably paying 420 if I'm lucky. So it's it's going to be a, a you're right. What what did you say? Chaos? Chaos. I wanted to say something else, but I won't say because we're on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is going to be absolute <laughs> chaos. And, I just, and also, I think you have to think of the emotion. As a buyer, you have a ton of emotion in this transaction. Yeah. When we come across issues, we're able to take the emotion out of it yeah. and present it to you in a very matter-of-fact way. This is the issue and this are the solutions. Which way do you want to go? As a buyer, your first reaction is going to be to freak out, to get oh. mad, to get angry. Yep. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it, you know, people need to go through that and really understand the entire process and what we do and the value we bring to then come back around and be like, now we get it now we understand. Yeah. Think about all the minds you've changed <clears throat> and I'll go in both directions here where they're mad and they want to back out of the deal. Mm -hmm. And then you keep them in logically. And later they're like, Oh my God, I love you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. That was, I was just crazy then, which we all do it. Uh, or the other way, they're so desperate, they want to stay with this mm -hmm. deal. And you come in and you're like, listen, I'm a salesman, I'm making commission off of this, and I think you should back out. Mm -hmm. This doesn't make any sense, right? Let's go find another house. Um, people need that. And uh, 
again, I, I know I'm a realtor, so it sounds like a pitch, but I just cannot imagine going to court for something that's four, five, six hundred thousand dollars or whatever the price of the home you're buying is, and being like, oh yeah, I want to save uh 10, 20 grand. So I'm just not gonna hire an attorney. That there's no way in hell I would do that. Mm-hmm. That's crazy to me. So I think it's gonna be interesting. I think that the hardest workers who are most flexible and engaged and can meld well with people and, and actually negotiate because everybody thinks they're a good negotiator um, and are not fear-based and are positive, those are going to be the people who win, the agents who win in this. Um, I think that a lot of the newer agents are going to be out because they're either fear-based, they, they don't even see some of the things we're talking about, they're not putting effort into you know selling their value, what do I have for value, they're, they're going to be gone. I think for buyers, it's going to be a lot of things are going to be worse. You might have higher closing costs because you're going to have to pay commissions or you're going to have a limited. um, Now, I think it's going to be minor limited, I think by five or 10 percent pool of houses to look at because those people won't pay commissions. And you decided that you and your realtor are not looking at homes that don't pay commissions. Um. I don't think you're going to get a better price because Mm -hmm. any seller who is selling for say 400 grand, if you come to them direct and you're not represented, every buyer I've ever seen says, so I want to take that 3% off the price and I'm going to pay you 388. Every buyer, right? So you're probably going to pay it no matter what. The one thing I think that's going to help out buyers is hopefully buyer's agents are going to be influenced lawfully to have to explain their value. Buyers are going to get into the culture of shopping agents and finding an agent, not just who picks up their phone, but who's actually amazing. Uh, I think that's a phenomenal thing. I think for sellers, I don't know if I see any positives for sellers. I I think it's going to be more confusing I think a a small portion of sellers are going to say, we don't want to pay out a buy side commission and it's going to hurt them way more than it helps them. I think it's going to slow down agents because now if I want to schedule five showings, you know, Lizette, if I want to schedule five showings, three, I'm going to get done in the next 20 minutes. The other two, I'm going to be waiting until one Mm o'clock, three o'clock, five. They might not even get back to me. Right. But in addition to scheduling it before I can even schedule it, I got to know, are you, are you, can we negotiate a commission? Because if I can't, my buyer's not even interested, right? Mm-hmm. So it's just going to add more time and effort. Um, can I throw you one last curveball, is that? Of course. <laughs> so the DOJ has come out. Have you heard about this? I have. I have. <laughs> okay. So the, the DOJ has come out and they have not, you know, laid down the law or anything like that. They've just whispered that mm-hmm. they are not excited to see realtors make commissions. They want to see realtors charge hourly, much like an attorney would. And at first, I think that sounds... Well, let me shut up. Let me ask you, what do you think of that? Well, I actually read a little bit of the article and the statement on that. And I believe if I read it correctly and understood it correctly, it was an option of either hourly or flat fee. I kind of like the flat fee. The hourly is going to be, I mean, I don't see the buyer winning with hourly, to be honest. I think the amount of work and the time frame that we work with these clients, sometimes it takes us six months yeah. to be able to get these clients to a closing table. Is all that time being accounted for? How are we accounting for that time? How are we reporting that over? I think the hourly fee, not only is it more complicated, but it's not going to do any justice to the buyer. Some buyers need more handholding. They need more time. And then they're going to get a closing fee with a crazy amount of time that we're billing them. I I don't know. I kind of like the flat fee a little bit more. Um, But whether it's flat fee, where there's commission percentage, the argument is that we don't collude or we don't all agree on pricing the same for the same fee. Um, and I think what people don't understand is it's just a standard. It's a norm. It's a norm. It's it's yeah. not saying that you have to pay 6%, but that's just the regular going rate. That's just what people were doing. And I think you're going to have the same thing if you try to do it with a flat fee. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, I do think, I, I don't like the hourly because 
you're gonna have to bill people like weekly or whatever it is because there's no way i'm gonna let you run up a ten thousand dollar bill and you just <laughs> it, right exactly. um so now i gotta have a billing department which is a pain in the butt um and right now i am highly motivated when i list your house or you're my buyer if i list your home i'm putting a ton of work into the research to make sure we price it right to the marketing to the like everything everything involved and if you're a buyer i am digging into properties and i'm not just scheduling showings i'm looking up in the county appraisers uh department online how old is your roof how old is your ac how many permits have been pulled what type of exterior wall do you have? All those different things. I would have to now ask a buyer to do every single one of those things before I do it. I'd have to wait for their response, but then I would be in an appointment so it wouldn't get done until the next day. So service is gonna slow down immensely, just like it does with attorneys. And then I'm only gonna do the minimal because I'm gonna be concerned about charging. Like I don't wanna overcharge you and if I do a ton of it and I do a really good job, then it's going to be expensive. Um, and you're also not motivated. Like, let's take a seller, for example. Let's say we know this home's going to sell at 450 All the comps support 450 And right now they say, I'd like to start it at 475 Any good realtor is going to, again, explain why it's probably not going to sell at 475 how it hurts you to list it at 475 how it benefits you to be at 450. They're going to go through all those details because they don't want a losing listing. They want something that's actually going to sell. And that benefits the seller because had they listed at 475 and then dropped to 460 and then dropped to 450, now it doesn't sell for 450. It sells for 440 or 445 because it's market worn, right? Whereas a listing that's worth 450 on day one and listed for 450 that is going to sell it's hot it's exciting you got all your buyers interested you got multiple offers you can leverage well now if i'm getting paid hourly i'm thinking sure listed at 475 because the longer it takes and the more time and effort i gotta put in the more i'm gonna get paid i don't like that at all and let me ask you this lizette what would you do whatever your fee is pick your fee it doesn't matter your flat fee right what are you gonna do when you get that buyer who wants to go out and look at homes eight times 10 times 12 times and each one of those eight 10 12 times you're looking at five or six homes so you're looking at 40 50 60 homes and now you can't take care of your other clients because you've got an undecisive couple what do you do with that yeah well yeah that's gonna i mean how again just back to getting that build <laughs> we're now going to be billing you to go take yeah. a look at all those houses over all that time it's just not feasible the, our, the way that we work and the, yep. the amount of work that's required of us as an agent hourly just doesn't fit um so it's just a little bit of a mess right now it's very murky and what i think is going to happen the next coming months we're going to see this getting even more mixed up <clears throat> a little bit even more murky until we finally figure it out and everyone comes to an agreement but I think this is just the tip of the iceberg and I think it's going to get more messy and we're probably going to see more emails from the board trying to explain us to how to walk through this new challenge and how maybe we should address it. Um, and again, I think the July deadline was a little bit too ambitious. Yeah, I, I, I saw it move to August. I'm waiting for it to move to September and October and mm -hmm. but we'll see. But well, hey, this has been a great discussion. I appreciate you coming on and doing this. If you are a buyer or a seller, hopefully you got a lot of value out of this. Um, again, everything that we're talking about is all hearsay. And, you know, if I read one uh, article today, it's going to be very different than the article I read next week until it's in writing and we have something solidified, but we're just not a hundred percent sure on how this is all going to play out, but hopefully you got some value out of this. Hopefully you got some insight. If there's one thing that I hope you got out of this as a buyer, it's that you already don't wait for the lawsuit thing to, to, you know, come about you already should be shopping your buyer's agent. I, I hope you love me. I hope you love Lizette. I hope you want to work with us. But even if you love me, go talk to another agent. See if they offer more, something different, whatever. Now, don't do that a month down the road once we've already got our relationship established. But do it on day one. And then you'll either know Joe wasn't the best option. I'm going to go with this other guy. Or, man, I'm even more confident in Joe now because I've done my research and talked to a couple agents. That's the one thing. If you got anything out of this, I hope you got. Uh, Lizette, again, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it as you do every week.